All right, I think I'm going to get started. Um, can someone just make sure that they can hear me? Like, type it in the lecture conferences channel. We can hear you, man. Perfect, perfect. OK, so um, thank you all for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you for BioCore for hosting this uh, lecture today. So today I'll be talking about the structure of DNA and RNA. Uh, shout out to Sailor for making this amazing poster here. So just a few things um, to preface. So I'll be talking a lot about models today and a few of the models that we use aren't 100% like uh, like accurate, but it's good to use in order to understand this at a structural level. So there are more complex ways to deal with the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, so we could talk about that um, afterwards. So basically, a rundown of the show, we're going to be talking about what are the major principles that govern the structure of DNA and RNA. Um, mainly, the outline is going to be starting with a breeze through the building blocks of nucleic acids. And then we're going to be delving a lot into the structure of the double helix, primarily looking at the forms of DNA and RNA, the major and minor grooves, uh, van der Waals forces and Coulombic electrostatics, as well as sugar conformation um, in the actual uh, structure itself. So um, I'm going to breeze through uh, the building blocks of nucleic acids because um, this is stuff you probably already encountered in your biology classes, but I'm going to breeze through them really quickly and point out what's going to be important for us uh, from a structural standpoint. So the building blocks of nucleic acids are obviously the nucleotides. We have the phosphate groups, as well as your sugar and your nitrogenous base. What's going to be really important for us in structural biology, at least when looking at the overall structure of the double helix is going to be the existence of the hydroxyl group or the absence of the hydroxyl group on the two prime sugar of uh, on the two prime carbon of the sugar which makes the difference between deoxyribose sugar and ribose sugar this is going to be really important for us to understand later on because of the idea of repulsion um, between this and your uh, phosphate backbone. So these images are really good and really helpful. We have our nitrogenous bases here, which we'll go over really uh, quickly later on on why it's important and why um, uracil particularly is not really found in DNA. So characteristics of nucleic acids, uh, we have, it's a polymer made of these nucleotides going in an anti-parallel fashion um, from the five prime end to the three prime end um, in DNA and RNA. We also have the linkages by these phosphate groups, our phosphodiester bonds. Of course, all of this could be really gone over in Anz's lecture on biochemistry, so I'm just going to briefly breeze over them. So we have these phosphodiester bonds that link together these um, nucleotides to create the long chain. On the right, we have these groups uh, of nitrogenous bases that base pair with the other side. Um, I'm not a big fan of weak and strong. Um, one is weaker and one is stronger. Um, when we have adenine and um, thymine hydrogen bonding, they create two hydrogen bonds. And guanine and cytosine um, create three hydrogen bonds. I really want to stress that hydrogen bonds are between uh, this electronegative atom attached to a hydrogen to another electronegative atom like oxygen or nitrogen. It's not between two hydrogens, uh, which is a common misconception that I hear about a lot. What I also want to um, bring up and what's going to be important in structural biology is that we have these peering groups that always hydrogen bond to a pyrimidine, pyrimidine having one ring and purines having two rings. This is going to be really important because when we look at the hydrogen bonding between 
nitrogenous bases. It's going to be very important because if we misplace, let's say, a purine bonds with another purine, uh, that could create um, this distance, too much distance between the bases, which disrupts hydrogen bonding throughout the entire structure of DNA. So it's really important to have a purine always um, bond with a per, uh, hydrogen bond with a pyrimidine. And in RNA, uh, thymine is replaced by uracil. So we're going to look at the structure of the double helix, which is going to be very important and the meat of today's discussion. So this is a quite a busy slide, but we'll walk through it. So we have the forms of DNA, and I forgot to write, and RNA. So we have A form a, uh, RNA, B form DNA, and Z form DNA. What we're most familiar with is going to be B form DNA, which is going to be our classic right-handed double helix which goes obviously in a right-handed fashion. Uh, the characteristics is that we have 10 base pairs per turn, and we'll take a look at why that's the case in a future slide. We'll also see that it has an accessible major and minor groove, which the next slide will talk about that. So the classic form of DNA that we see um, the double helix is going to be our B form DNA. Uh, if you ever go to a science website or some place that um, just has a blanket DNA structure, you'll be surprised how many times they show left handed DNA um, as opposed to right handed DNA. So if you want to catch um, some places, you could definitely point out the handedness. We have A form D um, RNA which is when RNA can form a double helix itself uh, with, its, um, with uh, self-complementary uh, strands. So in RNA, as we know, it's classically a, um, a single-stranded molecule, but if there's a section of RNA that is complementary to itself, it could uh, create a double helix. Uh, we'll also see A form when we have RNA and DNA hybrids. So that's going to be where we see this form, and we'll explain why that's the case. Z-form DNA is quite rare, and we don't really know exactly when we see uh, Z-form DNA. We see Z-form DNA um, in the form of when we have maybe different salt conditions, but Z-form DNA in itself is left-handed. So we see this weird structure here. Um, we won't be talking too much about Z-form DNA because personally, I don't know too much about it myself, but it's good to know that um, it's, uh, this is how it works right there. So uh, this table is a very good table that explains the differences between A-form, B-form, and Z-form DNA. Uh, I found this was helpful when I was studying it. Um, what I'm going to bring a lot of attention to is that B-form DNA, like I said, has 10 base pairs per turn, like one complete turn of DNA. I'm going to bring a lot of... Sorry, I heard something. Okay, I'm going to continue. So uh, B-form DNA is going to have 36 degrees rotation per base pair, and we could uh, explain that in terms of the repulsion later on. A-form um, DNA and RNA is slightly different with 10 base pairs per turn and approximately 34 degrees um, rotation per base pair. Again, this could be explained when we go more in depth in a future slide. Um, so this is a good summary of uh, the differences between A-form, B-form, and Z-form um, nucleic acids. So, major and minor grooves. So the major groove, if we look at this classic image right here of a base pair, Watson-Crick base pairs between guanine and cytosine, the major groove is created on the convex side of the pair, and it's convex relative to the glycosidic bonds between the nitrogenous base, sorry this image is a bit small, but the nitrogenous base and the sugar. So the convex side is going to be our major group, and our concave side is going to be our minor group. And this is depicted in this image as well. We see this major groove right here and the minor groove rather small. Um, why is this important? Because the major groove is where we have alpha helices and other proteins bond to the double helix and to the structure. So this is really important in sequence recognition 
and for the alpha helices of proteins to actually um, attach and do their thing on DNA. If we look to a model of A-form DNA, because of its interesting structure, its major and minor groove are quite different and not as accessible as B-form DNA. So uh, this brings to the big discussion on why major and minor grooves are important. And most importantly, what I found really interesting was one of the reasons why uracil is not found in um, in DNA is because of the sequence recognition importance in the major groove. So if we look to this bottom two, we have um, adenine and we have thymine right here. And if you look at their major groove and they're labeled, excuse me, sorry, they're labeled right here with hydrogen bond acceptor, a hydrogen bond a donor, and um, we have these other uh, labels and the methyl group for um, for thymine. And yes, uracil is found in DNA sometimes, but is quickly repaired out, as uh, Frogs mentioned. Uh, but what's important for us is that in uracil, there's the lack of the... Um, of the methyl group right here. So if we were to put the sequence in the DNA major groove minus the methyl group, we'll see that the AT and TA basically look the same with red, blue, red, red, blue, red. The existence of the methyl group tells us whether the bond could either be AT or TA. If we look above here with the um, bonding between guanine and cytosine, we see that their existence of the hydrogen atom here helps distinguish the sequence between GC and CG. Here, this is just one of the reasons why um, uracil is going to be very... Um, it, uracil is not commonly found in DNA. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, I did not... I, do recall uh, reading that uracil was found in DNA, but uh, for the sake of this conversation, I think it's important to know that for the reason why we have thymine is, and why it's really important because it helps us distinguish between AT and TA sequences by the existence of the methyl group. Otherwise, they look pretty much the same on either strand. Okay, so characteristics of the helix, we have this classic uh, drawing of the helix, and there's some, if we look very carefully, we could see the individual atoms themselves represented by these uh, balls here. And we have, uh, we could, we have the major groove right here uh, labeled, and we have the minor groove here labeled. We also have our distinct purines and pyrimidines. And if we notice, here's this, uh, what's important for us, and what I want to spend some time talking about today is going to be why there's the certain distance between them. If we have one turn of DNA being about 3.4 nanometers or 34 um, angstroms, I believe, yes, um, this is going to be really important. And the distance between individual base pairs, uh, between two sequential base pairs, is going to be um, three. Thir uh, 0.34 nanometers or 0.34 uh, or 3.4 angstroms in that sense. So we're going to go into this, why this is the case. And I find it quite elegant, actually. So if we remember from our first lecture, we went over van der Waals forces and we went over the idea behind um, the optimal distance. And the optimal distance given here, uh, the radius in terms of angstroms, and we see that as they get over on this side, on the right side of the graph, they're becoming more and more far apart. So we have, let's say, five angstroms here. There's not that strong of an attractive force. So the energy, in this case, if we look at this diagram, goes to zero. But as we get closer and closer, the attractive force comes together and they reach a happy medium. And a happy medium would be this optimal distance right here where the energy well in this drawing is it's at its lowest in these uh, Morse potential energy diagrams. So this is the optimal distance they want to be in um, in order to have as much attraction as possible. But if they get closer and closer, you'll see the energy steeply rises up, meaning that they're getting to the point where there's electrostatic repulsion. And that's going to be when they're way too close to each other. So 
uh, they're constantly balancing between the two. And quantitatively, if we look at our van der Waals forces, the optimal distance um, after experimentation could be found by two atoms and basically adding their van der Waals radius. So the uh, list of van der Waals radii and relative electronegativity is given on this scale right here. Uh, we could see that the van der Waals radius for carbon is approximately 1.7 angstroms. And the, um, <laughs> I see that in the chat. Uh, <laughs> And the um, van der Waals radius for nitrogen is 1.6 uh, angstroms. So this is going to be important because when we look at the sum and the distance, the optimal distance between two base pairs, we're going to be mainly looking at carbons and nitrogen um, here. And when we experimentally measure the distance between two base pairs, we see that there are approximately 3.4 angstroms between each sequential base pair. And this is interesting because that's actually around the sum of a carbon and a nitrogen um, and their van der Waals radii. We estimate 3.4, some of them saying 3.5, but 3.4 would be if you added the um, the uh, distance between carbon and nitrogen in their van der Waals forces. So Kraken, that's a really good question. How do we measure the distance between base pairs? So we can get, um, we can isolate, from what I understand, I haven't done it myself, <laughs> but from what I understand, we could find a model of DNA. We could do some kind of purification and find their, um, really their, uh, kind of a, almost a crystal model form. Someone with better knowledge can explain this later, but we can isolate it, and then we could put it into a program which kind of structures it, and we can measure the relative distance between them. Of course, I haven't done this. Um, there are definitely ways to do it, um, but that's how we could get the structures and measure the distance between them themselves. There are some really cool scripts that I could share later on where you could upload them into some kind of mo molecule um, visualization software where you can actually experimentally uh, or you could quantitatively measure distance between um, individual base pairs. So that's a really great question. And once they figured this out, they found that it's approximately 3.4 um, angstroms per sequential um, uh, DNA base pairing. So let's see, okay. So I wanna talk about this a little bit more and I kind of prefaced earlier that there's an about in B form DNA approximately 10 degrees of separation between each uh, base uh, each sequential base. And I don't know why I don't have that slide on me right now. Okay, I'm very sad about that. So if we go back to this slide, so when we look at um, this rotation, we see that they're rotating around the central axis. And it's rotating in B-form DNA at approximately 10 degrees per base pair. Uh, leading up to, oh, sorry, 36 degrees per base pair, leading up to 10 base pairs per turn of DNA. And this is because we want to avoid the repulsion between the phosphate backbone and the actual sugars themselves. So what this is important and what this leads to is the idea of sugar conformation right here. So as we know, there's a sugar <laughs> as part of the nucleotide itself. And the sugar is a, is a ring of carbons with an oxygen attached as well. And what's important is that these sugars, uh, they don't exist. They can't be in a solid plane, in the same plane as themselves, or at least at the same level because of there's just too much repulsion and there's a lot of ring strain in this. So as such, in DNA, we have one side kind of poke up and we call these sugar puckers or sugar conformations. Of course, there are more exact ways to deal with this. Um, if you take organic chemistry, there's a bet much better way to describe it than I am describing it right now. Ooh. Okay, 
So we have these sugar conformations. And if we look at this model right here, which shows the sugar right here and the phosphate backbone, we see that there's a distance between them at approximately 1.9 angstroms in this diagram. Now, what this is important is, and if we put it in a space filling model in DNA, it's really, really close. And if we consider what RNA looks like, RNA has, if, you re if we remember from the first couple slides, has a hydroxyl group on the two prime sugar. So if we add an oxygen here instead of a hydrogen, we don't have enough space in the current conformation that it is. So if we go to any A-form DNA and RNA, we have a different sugar popped up in order to allow for that hydroxyl group to minimize repulsion and to maximize attraction. So that's why we have these different conformations and these different sugars poking out of the ring for that exact reasons, to avoid that repulsion and to gain that attraction. And in B-form DNA, we have these at the two prime endo sugars popping up in order to avoid that. So three prime XO and two prime XO are rare. We don't really see them. Um, but that's a reason why we have these sugar conformations and why we have different rotations, because we want to avoid this phosphate backbone. So if we think about this, our entire molecule of DNA in the helix is kind of, we want, to, um, we want to have a balancing game between attraction and repulsion. We want enough attraction so that it's stabilized. And we, want a, we don't want repulsion. So we get away as far as possible without breaking our optimal distance, which ends up being this structure that we get here. We get this structure where we have a nice rotation of about 36 degrees per base pair for 10 base pairs per turn. So I'm not a mathematician, but I know that multiplies up to 360 degrees. Um, yes, there, uh, there are definitely more sugar conformations, and these are just some of the reasons why uh, the helix can actually turn. So I'm just giving some examples. There's are many, many more as brought up by um, in the chat. So that's really important to understand as well. So what we have is this rotation right here around. So we have 10 base pairs, 36 degrees, complete circle um, for the helix itself. So that's what I find quite elegant in this structure. What I also find quite elegant is the spacing between each base pair at approximately 3.4 angstroms uh, per base pair. And when we talk about the stabilization of the double helix, we know when we were talking about our van der Waals forces and the additive effect of it, if we have all the bases stacked up against each other, they create a really strong attraction and can stabilize the double helix itself. So that's quite beautiful in that sense. Uh, we also know that hydrogen bonding between the nucleotides themselves helps stabilize the um, help stabilize the double helix. But another reason uh, it's not necessarily the strongest force is in an aqueous solution, we always have waters and other polar molecules kind of competing for attractions and competing for um, hydrogen bonds with our um, nucleotides. Of course, in the cell, there are ways for DNA to resolve this, uh, whether it's coiling up on itself or trying to get away from these molecules. But that's going to be a reason why we have kind of both base stacking between the bases themselves adding up to the strong stabilizing effect and the hydrogen bonds. And of course, the phosphodiester linkage making up that primary strong covalent structures. And the final thing I want to talk about is um, just one of the reasons why we don't have, like, if you accidentally have a purine going with another purine, a hydrogen bonding with another purine, we, the cell tries to correct these errors as quickly as possible. It's because if we replace, let's say, this pyrimidine with a purine, we have a much larger molecule. It pushes both sides of the helix apart. And if we go back to our diagrams, uh, one of the diagrams, not that one. The diagram right here, the optimal distance is it's very, very specific. Uh, 
And if we push the two apart, it disrupts the hydrogen bonding for all of the other uh, base pairs. So the cell tries to correct this as quickly as possible so that we have this optimal distance for hydrogen bonding throughout all of the base pairs here. So that's why we don't see purine-purine and purine-pyrimidine uh, purine purine or pyrimidine pyrimidine all over the place because their distance actually matters a lot um, when going through the hydrogen bonding um, in the double helix. And we'll see this also in proteins. If you look at membrane proteins, especially um, dimers that come together, if you replace one residue with an extremely large residue, it might prevent um, dimerization. And we can go into this more specifically, but in general, the distance between residues is going to be very, very important. So that kind of ends my lecture uh, today, my brief lecture into the structure of the double helix. Um, I really like this model right here because it shows really everything that's going on and everything that really creates this structure that we know as DNA. Um, I, when I first learned this, I thought it was really fascinating how um, we could kind of estimate and explain why there's a separation uh, between the certain separation distance um, between each base pair or between hydrogen bonds themselves. And um, I hope this helps really explain the double helix as well as the structure of nucleic acids. As mentioned in the chat, this is not the most thorough lecture. There's a lot of other ways and more specific ways we could estimate, sorry, estimate and kind of examine the structure itself. But from a very kind of broad structural biology standpoint, this is gonna be a really helpful way to start. And if you're more interested, there are definitely a lot of resources that tell more about this structure and how we could determine it itself. So big thanks to BioCord for hosting the lecture and huge thank you to Sailor for creating the amazing graphic. And of course, there are a bunch of um, images that I borrowed and cited from these amazing sources here. So if you have any questions, you could feel free to ask, um, ask away. I love you, Polar. Thank you. <laughs> So I'll, I'll stick around if anyone has any questions. I turned off the stream just because my computer might go berserk if I have so much going on at the same time.